this analysis, uh, Magnus, as many Norwegians, he's um, a proud owner of an electric vehicle. Uh, he purchased a Tesla recently. So <laughs> the real purpose of this paper is to, for Magnus to convince himself, the easy part, and he, everyone else, including his co-author, that this is a good thing for the environment. So let's see. Uh, thank you for the introduction, uh, Odin. Uh, uh, my name is Magnus, a professor from, uh, from Norway. So I'm going to talk about uh, CO2 factors for electricity and uh, CO2 footprint of electricity consumption. And uh, according to the introduction from, uh, from Odin here, the question is, did this uh, research interest come as a result of me buying a Tesla, or was it the opposite way around? So let's see about that for the conclusion. So, um, so the outli outline of this uh, speech is that we are quickly going to uh, define CO2 factors, uh, discuss why they are important, uh, show the, the different calculation methods, uh, and then we'll have a brief discussion about uh, uh, what the impacts are, uh, would be of, for instance, using marginal emission factors for added, added loads to the system. And then I will illustrate this uh, through a rather simple, but hopefully a bit clarifying uh, example. So CO2 emission factors is just uh, uh, CO2 emissions that is associated with uh, electricity consumption. So it's uh, uh, in order to, to, to calculate a CO2 factor for consumption, we need to find a way to, uh, uh, to distribute the actual measured emissions to the different consumers. So it's not straightforward because emissions, point emissions happens at, uh, uh, um, at the power plants. So it's a uh, long distance both geographically and also mentally from the actual emissions to the consumption. And there exist several different methods for associating CO2 emissions to consumption, and that can have some interesting results on the conclusion on whether uh, 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 consumption is considered as env environmental friendly or not. Uh, some examples, uh, recent examples. Uh, uh, Google is very proud, and they should be very proud, of buying now all their electricity from renewable energy sources. Uh, Looking into a bit into details about this, we see that they actually now uh, buy their power from wind farms and solar uh, power plants. Uh, and uh, I, uh, uh, it's possibly so that they mean that their annual consumption equals the annual generation from these plants. They are not load following their, their, prod their production. Uh, similar kind of thinking is uh, from this, uh, what we call uh, zero emission buildings or net zero energy systems, uh, where it's, uh, you, you cannot see it here, but what it says is that, okay, we are claiming to be zero emission or zero energy or uh, carbon neutral uh, on an annual basis. So our consumption uh, in total over the year equals the uh, annual generation of our uh, renewable power plants. So, um, so the final example, which I think is quite uh, interesting myself, is from Norway. Here in Norway, we have 98% uh, hydropower. It's shown here uh, with blue uh, fossil thermal, ter thermal power plants. Uh, accounts only to 2% of our uh, production. But uh, Norway is part of a volunteer program uh, that is called uh, Guarantees of Origin, which means that consumers from uh, Netherlands or Germany or Norway or Poland can buy uh, guarantees of origin from Norwegian hydropower plants for their consumption. So they get their contract says that we have uh, your consumption is associated with uh, Norwegian hydropower. And hydropower producers then get 
some uh, added income, and the result is that this amount of hydropower is then sold through guarantees origin uh, to Netherlands and Germany. Uh, this part is sold as guarantees of origin uh, in, in Norway. And if you look at the, uh, uh, this, this rest part here, uh, which is then, uh, then also uh, the same as the electricity uh, consumption in Norway that is not associated with guarantees of, of origin, we will see that most of the Norwegian consumption is then associated with either nuclear power or thermal power because the hydropower uh, is kind of sold out, not physically, because we cannot export that much, but the, let's say, the greenness of the, uh, uh, of the power. So in terms of, of actual numbers, the average CO2 factor of consumption or, uh, CO2 factor of consumption in Europe is 345 grams per kilowatt hours. Now, if we calculate what we actually physically consume in Norway, we end up with 10 uh, grams per kilowatt hours. But when you then take into account that the hydropower is sold through guarantees of origin to the outside, the rest of the uh, energy consumption, power consumption in Norway, adds up to then 530 gram per kilowatt hours. And that is not what the Norwegian uh, consumers think, because they think that, yeah, well, we sold the uh, guarantees of origin to other countries, but hey, we still uh, consume uh, hydropower. So it means that the, it's a risk that uh, uh, renewable credits are kind of double counted because it's sold to someone out uh, uh, in another country, claiming that we actually paid for, the, for this renewable power, and then back home, yeah, yeah, we sold, but we, we are the ones that really use it. So it's double counting, and that's something that we have to be uh, aware of. So, so how do we then go forward to calculate uh, CO2 factors? So there are three uh, standard methods, I would say. One is as I just uh, introduced, the average CO2 factor, which is just that we take the annual uh, emissions and divide by the annual uh, consumption. Uh, there are two ways. Either we can just say that we have one value for all uh, consumers, or we can match the load profile of a specific consumer with the uh, hour to hour measured emissions in the, in the system. Then we have the marginal CO2 factor, the marginal emissions, which is then if you look at uh, new power consumption. For instance, electric vehicles can say that, okay, what is the CO2 emissions associated with adding electric vehicles to the power system? Okay, then we can calculate the short-term marginal factor or some ca uh, can then say that, okay, we add the, uh, electric vehicle, and uh, for, for powering that, we need to ramp up some coal power plants. So it's very polluting. Uh, that's a claim. And then someone then can say, well, hey, uh, but the new, uh, the new consumption will then trigger new investments. So uh, then we can use investment models or capacity expansion models or other calculation methods to try to estimate how the new consumption trigger new generation. And that could be wind power. And then they could claim that it's the, the, the CO2 factor is zero here because the new consumption triggers wind power. It's 1,000 grams per kilowatt hour here because uh, you have to ramp up a coal power plant in average. Or you just use the average value, which might be something between zero and uh, gas power plants. If it's, a, if it's a rather low emission uh, system. Uh, and the, for the average CO2 factor, what is important is the system boundaries. So if you, 
in Norway. We are a part of the rest of Europe and also electrically with a short link. And it's seen in the literature studies that uses average CO2 factors for, CO for consumption in Norway using 10 grams per kilowatt hour, which is the Norwegian average, 130, which is the Nordic. Then they claim that, okay, we use this number because we have a Nordic power market. And then some use 350 because we are also linked to cables and transmission lines to the rest of Europe. And then if you use this number, we use this number for today. But towards 2050, it might be lower. So you also have to decide whether you're using today's number or a future uh, estimate. For the shorter uh, marginal CO2 factor, as I just said, we have to calculate what is the added immediate generation. In this case, just shown that the uh, uh, increase in demand in Norway then leads to a short-term increase in generation, uh, presumably thermal power at the continent because we are hydro-dominated. It, it doesn't rain more just because I buy a, an electric vehicle. But in the long run, we trigger a new investment here then associated with wind power. So then, uh, then we get a very low uh, CO2 emission factor. So, um, so I just said that, OK, electric vehicle is one example, because that is often discussed and also often compared with the CO2 emissions of other types of vehicles. But OK, so if we first calculate CO2 factors for different, different loads, uh, do we distinguish between different loads when we use CO2 factors? This is, uh, uh, I mean, that it's obviously that we shouldn't. But are, uh, are our methods kind of able, are we able to use the same method for all loads? Uh, and does any type of load kind of consider like a base load associated with the existing power plant feet, fleet? Or, um, uh, and if so, how can we agree on this? And what does it really mean uh, what's in your contract with your retailer or the guarantees of origin? So uh, just a sh short, this is just for maybe for coffee discussion about marginal emissions. Uh, for, for instance, electric vehicles, use that as an example. Can we use marginal emissions to, to analyze the en environmental impact of electric vehicles? Then you can argue yes, because we increase the demand from now if we integrate a lot of electric vehicles. And that will cause an increase in generation and thus increase emissions. Or we can say, no, marginal emissions is not the relevant uh, metric. Because if we use that for electric vehicles, we should use it for all kinds of loads. Like, for instance, if we turn out uh, a new, uh, new light here in this room, and if you use marginal emissions for all uh, consumption, it doesn't add up. So we have to make up our mind. Do we distinguish between? new electric vehicles and existing are using marginal emissions for these and average no and average for these in case that uh, then you have to say okay when does a new electric vehicle becomes an existing one going from marginal emission accounting to average and do we distinguish between different type of loads. And then you have to have a very good reason to say, yes, we do. So finally, I'll just show some calculation examples from an illustrative uh, study. We're taking, uh, as a starting point, uh, data from the European uh, power system, uh, a scenario for 2050, rather low carbon. Uh, we used uh, soon to be very famous uh, uh, linear system optimization model uh, called Yes mod. Uh, it's an uh, uh, abbreviation for yet another ex uh, capacity expansion model, which is exactly what it is. So it's a 
minimization of total cost of a system. And uh, uh, it doesn't take into account grids, the demand flexibility, but just optimizes the power plant fleet, fleet, fleet uh, as a function of the demand and the time series used for solar and wind. So pushing the run button in Julia uh, gets us a, like an optimum uh, system. Uh, we see that we have much more uh, capacity installed than the maximum load. This can look like it's very much better here, it's the smoothing effect of wind and solar throughout the whole of Europe is accounted for here. So even though we have overcapacity, we do not have much curtailment. Uh, and I haven't included grids. So that's another reason why we don't have much curtailment. So don't ask about that. So uh, the average uh, CO2 factor is pretty low. Uh, shorter marginal is not very high. We have two uh, thermal power plants here only for illustration, uh, OCGT and uh, CCGT. And we have some overcapacity of overproduction of uh, uh, renewables, which gives us quite low shorter marginal emissions. So this is the system optimum. Now what happens if we look at different trade arrangements for the customers. So assuming that uh, PV owners uh, have their own consumption that, act, that uh, matches the generation exactly, the same for onshore wind. They, they have contracts, annual contracts with uh, consumers that exactly matches their yearly production. Uh, and they have to trade their hourly imbalances in the, uh, in the spot market, while the rest of the consumers, about 45%, buy all their energy on spot. And here is the point when these two guys have an imbalance, hourly imbalance, they have, to, uh, they, they have too much production. They are selling that to the spot market and to someone else, and these guys they are uh, buying it, so they rightfully claim that part of their consumption come from wind and solar. But if we look at the annual contracts, the annual netting alone, we, we then end up with a situation like this, that the system average is uh, quite low. The other consumers suffer because all, because all the thermal generators are associated with them and these two uh, leaves happy. So if we then look at the actual hourly balances, we see that the PV pro prosumers comes not as good out anymore because of their, uh, their time, um, uh, yeah, the timing of their production and their consumption. And the other consumers then have a slight reduction in their uh, uh, CO2 footprint. So what can these two guys do to improve their uh, CO2 foot, foot, uh, footprint? Soon done. So they can start with the cheapest one, just trade their imbalances with, their, with each other. So when solar is on surplus, you can buy, uh, then the wind owner can buy that uh, and vice versa. And that helps for them. They, they trade their surplus, uh, their imbalances. And of course, the other consumers that just buys the rest electricity then gets a higher uh, CO2 uh, footprint. And we can, of course, also then add storage, which makes the CO2 footprint go down not only for these guys, but also for the system as, as a whole. But to what cost? So to summarize, the example is that uh, we cannot just do annual netting of uh, renewable energy contracts uh, because it can lead to double counting. Uh, uh, and uh, we found out through a simple case study that PV pro uh, prosumers get quite high CO2 factors when we actually account for the physical imbalances. 
So bilateral, bilateral trade with other renewable uh, uh, producers can help, and also storage. But is, it, is storage for self-balancing cost efficient for, in the system point of view? That is what we are studying at the moment. So finally, I will say that the average CO2 factor is a quite fair way to, to account for emissions. Short-term marginal CO2 factor is quite difficult to use at large scale because it doesn't add up. Long-term uh, CO2 factor is a good theoretical uh, method, but how do we know that uh, new demand actually will trigger the new investment that we found out in our optimization models? We can only guess. So finally, I will just say that uh, don't tell me this is fossil fuels. <laughs> OK, thank you. Hey, great. Thanks, Magnus. Any questions? Perfect, okay. clear. People want coffee, so let me just ask them, did your uh, purchase reduce your carbon footprint? That's, I guess you indicate the answer there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I had uh, I, I had an automatic gasoline uh, car before, but uh, I use the car more now, so I don't know. The, I have not included the LCA analysis in this calculation. <laughs> so it's the rebound effect. It's a rebound, it's a rebound effect, it's true. Okay, so coffee break next, but we'll resume as scheduled at uh, 3.40. Thank you.